on the cloud so we can share it later. Janelle, Mary had commented in the chat box. Um, what are you trying to do? I'm pretty good at Zoom meetings. No, I'm just trying to get it to uh, to have it live uh, in 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 our Facebook page in C Flag. That's what I'm. Do, do you have down at uh, uh, as the host? Uh, yeah. It should pop up and say live Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Okay, yeah, I got it here and I'm sharing. Okay, then click on the live Facebook. Mm -hmm. And if you enter your Facebook URL, it should automatically go there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a description and everything written down for it in Facebook. I did it before. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with us. Okay, let's see. Okay, so let's uh, let's get moving, right? Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm playing uh, technology today. We haven't done a Zoom this big before. Uh, certainly, uh, we are um, we're adapting or trying to adapt to uh, the present conditions and. Uh, this is a program that some of you have been in before. Uh, we do it every year since uh, 2012, and uh, you know there's no there's no reason why we shouldn't have at least some type of educational component for you guys, because uh, some of you are not familiar with Central Florida Livestock Agents Group. I have a little bit of information for you on how this is hopefully going to pan out. Um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick here and um, and we will go through um, the uh, the instructions on and probably you have seen them already because I sent them out uh, earlier uh, yesterday on an, on an email basically um, very important uh, we're gonna have co-hosts that are going to be scanning the chat box for uh, your questions. When you have a question, please feel free to put it on the chat box. And then we're gonna have somebody that asks that question for you. So we can have some sort of uh, order um, and uh, out of respect for the, for the uh, speaker uh, or presenter as well. Um, we wanna keep everything relevant. Um, so uh, just feel free to uh, ask questions. Try to uh, just keep your mic muted just because we don't know when, you're, when your dog's are gonna bark or when your kid's gonna ask for juice or whatever. So, um, so we don't get distracted. Um, the other thing is that if uh, this, this class is made for uh, sheep and goat producers and uh, people uh, that live and, uh, and, 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 and invest their time in uh, sheep and goat production in some way. So uh, if you are in the wrong room, uh, you can, you're welcome to stay. But if you are uh, rude, um, we will take you out of the, of the uh, Zoom and uh, we're gonna block you uh, just as a matter of precaution because there's a lot of things that have happened in Zooms that we don't want happening now, okay? The other thing is that uh, there's gonna be, hopefully, uh, a lot of ideas thrown at you. Um, we're certainly educators. We're not, for the most part, uh, we're not masters in, 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 in sheep and goat production as farmers such as yourselves, but we are you know, here to throw ideas. And uh, this class is based on needs assessments that we have conducted over the years. And that's how we um, construct this class on ongoing efforts to educate 
and promote your industry wherever you are. I know that there's some people that are not in Florida and uh, that's, that's great. Uh, you probably have less COVID cases than we do, um, but uh, we are, uh, we're here to share ideas and uh, good science-based information. Um, the most important part for us is going to be that evaluation after the end of the program. Um, that evaluation is the, the, the thing, the tool that keeps us relevant, that keeps us going, that we can use to measure how much uh, impact we've had on, on you and uh, possible uh, ed educational events that can come out of this as the event unfolds. You're gonna think about something that you need and you're gonna uh, help us uh, with, with filling that evaluation. Um, this is the evaluation link and I'm gonna be sharing it uh, throughout the program. Um, we have four sessions. And uh, what we want to do is after every session, if you, if you, uh, there's some people that are registered for one session and not for the other. So if, uh, if you're not registered and you're done with, with our trainings, then we want you to go to, uh, to this link to Qualtrics and get, uh, a, 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 and we can catch that information that you can provide for us. So in the future, we can, we can help you in, in, in ongoing education uh, programs. So, as uh, you saw on the Eventbrite and other places that we have been advertising our program agenda, today's the first meeting. Um, so we're going to talk about business planning to uh, from going from hobbies to commercial. Now your screen um, is not being shared, my dear. Sorry? Your screen is not being shared if you're trying what? to share. Man, see, that's what happens. Um, let's see what I can do about that. Um, anyway, so the agenda, um, you're going to have it on, let me see here, this one. I don't like this one, but that's fine. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, going from hobby to, to commercial. Uh, I don't know where my screen, what are you seeing right now? Are you seeing it? Okay. You're seeing my email pop up? Yes, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about, about the first topic that we mentioned already, and then we're going to uh, have Francisco, uh, well, Meg's going to do the first one. Francisco's going to do the niche market and, and tapping to social media. Tomorrow, we're going to have a conversation, uh, conservation practices for small ruminant operations uh, topic, um, sire selection, uh, what, what you're going to be looking for in terms of a good sire, of course. Uh, the day after that session three, investing in, in animal welfare. That would be, I uh, would be uh, conducting that one, incorporating summer annuals into our pasture management program. That would be Caitlin Boehner from, uh, from Marion County. I forgot to mention that on session two, uh, Laura Bennett is the one that's gonna do our sire selection uh, talk. Last uh, part of the program, we're gonna have uh, Francisco conducting it uh, with a, a guest uh, speaker. Um, and he's gonna be talking about uh, animal, uh, artificial insemination, what, what you need to do, how you get started with it. And then we're gonna hopefully close with some remarks on, on, on what you've learned and uh, we, we can then have time for for you guys to fill that evaluation that we're gonna share. So um, with that, I'll have uh, Mrs. Meg Mann. She's a livestock agent uh, residing in Lake County, Florida. Uh, she's been with us for uh, how many, 15 years already? Nearly. Long time ago? I think it's actually lucky 13 this year. Okay, so a long time ago. Uh, and she's gonna be uh, uh, conducting our, our first topic, uh, which uh, you've, it's from hobby to commercial. Um, anyway, so Meg, take it away. All right, awesome. So um, yes, yeah, so my name is Meg and um, thank you for inviting me to teach Janelle. Um, I love to teach, um, but I've realized with COVID that what I really love is teaching in front of a live audience. And what I really hate is talking to myself on a computer. So. 
Um, I'm adjusting just like we all are to this new normal and, and getting used to this, but um, do please use the chat box to ask questions. Um, and today's topic that I'm going to try and cover in, in less than an hour is turning your hobby into a business. Um, when Jonelle first sent out our, whoa, I don't know what that's from. Um, when Jonelle first sent out our um, agenda, he accidentally misspelled hobby as hubby. Oh. And so I was assigned to t turn your hubby into a business. So if you were looking for that talk, that is not this. Um, I don't know how to do that and I don't plan to learn. Um, but I can certainly talk to you about turning your goat and sheep hobby into a business. Um, I always like to start out my classes by talking a little bit about extension for those of y'all who have not been to an extension class before. Um, just because I think what we do is pretty cool. Um, and, I, and I like to share kind of about what my job is and um, what our mission is. So we are part of the land grant university system. And each of the land grant universities throughout the um, United States has a threefold mission of teaching, research, and extension. And so teaching happens on campus. Um, right now, it's also like you guys happening online um, as people are trying to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, so our students are also participating on classes online. We have research stations around the state where research is taking place. And then extension kind of combines the research and teaching and make sure that this information gets out to the people that need it. So um, that makes the resources of the university available to everybody within the state um, and not just to the folks who are um, lucky enough to attend the University of Florida or um, directly involved in the research. And so what is our role in your sheep and goat business? And I kind of want to go through what we do and what we don't do. So I see one of our biggest roles is that we can be a really good source of unbiased information. So um, we do not have a dog in the fight. We do not get paid um, any sort of bonuses based on whether or not you take our advice. Um, we are just here to give you the facts and nothing but the facts. And we're really limited um, by what the science says. So I'm not paid for my opinion, even though I certainly have quite a few of them. I'm paid for my expertise. Um, so you can come to us and be um, very confident that the information that we give you that you're going to walk away with is information that has no bias and um, is going to be research based and science based and very sound. So we won't make the decision for you, but we can give you the right facts that you need to make your own decision. Um, we can also help you think through the process and help you ask the right questions. So sometimes when folks are starting out a business, they get really excited and passionate. And one of the roles that we can play is to kind of um, put a little bit of the brakes on things. I can sometimes be a professional wet blanket, um, but help you really think through the entire process and ask some of those questions that may not have occurred to you that um, could end up saving you quite a bit of time and money later on. And then another role that we can play is to help you make some connections with others um, in the industry as well as, as well as other agencies. Um, so we are an extension service, but there's also um, the Florida Department of Ag, there's the Farm Service Agency, there's NRCS, um, there's professional associations and industry associations. And because we have associations with all of these folks and agencies, we can help plug you into those places as well so you know um, kind of the right places to go for those sorts of connections. Um, a couple of things that we are not that I think is also equally important. We are not regulatory. Um, so that means that we don't write the regulations and we don't enforce the regulations. Um, so a lot of these things when we talk about going into business involves regulations and we can tell you what some of the regulations are, but we really like you to get those directly from the horse's mouth as well because we're not going to be the ones coming out to your farm to enforce the regulations. Um, but that's also good news for you guys because you can call us and be um, not worried about us coming out to um, find you or report you or anything like that. Um, we are also not a granting agency. I get a lot of folks calling and asking um, if they can get some money from us to start up their business. And if I had it, I would gladly share it with you, but we do not have it. So um, there are some um, cost share programs and some low interest loan programs available for beginning farmers. 
um, and um, some cost share programs available for different conservation practices. And again, we can certainly help you make those connections. Um, but I've been here for 13 years and I have not yet found the money vault that's been hidden in our office. So we have no money to give, unfortunately. And then the other important thing is that we do not have a crystal ball. Um, I get asked a lot, folks will call and say that they've got a little bit of land and they want um, me to tell them what business they should do that will be guaranteed to make a lot of money. And my answer is always, if I knew that, I would be doing it. Um, so we can help you, you know, make those good decisions and give you the right information, but ultimately it is your decision and your risk. And um, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, if we did, we probably would have predicted COVID, uh, you know, and being where we are out right now. But um, we have, um, you know, we can give you all the right information, but we can't guarantee your success and we can't do the hard work for you. So um, that risk of doing your business falls on you. So I want to give you a little overview of what I'm going to try and cover today, but starting with the disclaimer that, um, you know, A, there's no way possible I can cover everything that you need to know about starting a business in the 45-ish minutes that we have together. Um, so this will be a good jumping off place, hopefully give you a good place to start asking questions. I did send out, or Janelle sent out earlier today, um, a pretty extensive resource list um, with links to a ton of free resources um, that will go much more in depth into some of this stuff that I think will be very helpful to you. Um, the other disclaimer I want to provide is that um, this is tailored to people in Florida. And I understand that some of you folks who are on here today are from outside of Florida and from outside of the country. Um, and so I would definitely recommend that you um, speak to your local authorities about some of these things because they may differ depending on what part of the country that you're on, you're in, I'm sorry. Um, and you know, this is also not my particular area of expertise. So as an extension agent, sometimes we end up being kind of a um, jack of all trades, master of none. So my background is actually in ruminant nutrition is what my master's degree is in. Um, and I come from a pretty heavy equine background. Um, I really like goats and sheep. Um, but I have never been a goat or sheep farmer. I do have a herding dog that I do competitions with. So that's probably about as close as I get to being a shepherd um, is having an Australian shepherd. But, uh, you know, we'll try to do our very best to answer your questions, but we never give our opinions. And if we don't know the um, correct answer to your question, I would much rather tell you that we're going to go get back to you um, versus giving you the wrong information. Um, so today I want to start off with a little discussion about why even consider going professional with your business. Why would you, what are some reasons you might want to consider turning your hobby into a business? Then we're going to go through a couple of different options that are available to you, and, including dairy and, and what um, being a grade A dairy in Florida entails. A couple different options for selling meat in Florida, including selling directly to the market, live animals to the market, as well as, as, well as selling meat to the consumer. And then a brief discussion of a couple of other options that might allow you to monetize your hobby that you may or may not have thought of. Um, and then we're gonna kind of kick it off with a little discussion on getting started, um, some of the importance of record keeping, uh, feasibility studies, and a little bit on marketing. Francisco is gonna spend the um, latter part of this afternoon on marketing and I don't wanna steal his thunder, um, but I will do hopefully set it up well for him to take over. And at PGA, I see you have a question. If you can type that in the chat, they will be able to um, address that for you. All right, so let's talk about why we may want to consider going pro. Um, a lot of folks that I hear from, they start out with a couple of goats and funny things happen when you leave uh, male and female goats together, you end up with more goats and more goats turns into more goats and pretty soon their herd has grown and with their um, larger herd comes a larger feed bell and a larger health bill and um, they pretty pretty soon realize that they want to start getting um, some rent money paid back from these goats or sheep. So they may, um, the herd may have grown to the point that they think, you know, this is no longer a hobby sized herd and I would like to try and turn this into a business. Um, you may be in a position where you want to look at getting an alternative stream of income. Um, maybe you're wanting to supplement your traditional day job, or maybe you're, you know, trying to chase down the dream of um, eventually retiring from your day job um, and replacing all or, or some of your current income. Um, I've known some folks who have retired and gone into this as a second career later in life, um, and that is certainly an option. 
um, you may go pro because there is a demand for your product. And I think this is necessary to going pro. So if there is no demand for your product, then you kind of need to put the brakes on right there. Um, but some people will find that, you know, I've, I've knew someone who started selling goat meat because they had some pet goats and um, they actually had people pulling over and on the side of the road and asking if they could buy some kids because they couldn't source goat meat locally. Um, and when they had that happen often enough, they started to realize that there was a demand and, uh, and actually built a business around that. Um, you may also want to take advantage of a green belt classification or what we sometimes call the ag exemption, which allows you to um, pay lower property taxes on land that is in um, agricultural um, production. And it does have to be a bona fide agricultural business in order to do that. And so you may need to um, transition your herd from a hobby herd that you're keeping as um, pets or for personal milk production um, to something that you're actually keeping business records on and using as a business in order to do that. I also want to discuss a couple of, of very important reasons why you may not want to go pro. Um, oftentimes you may find that the um, production value does not justify the cost, um, especially when you're looking at something like you know, if you have a small herd and you're wanting to become a grade A dairy and you have to start from the ground up, um, that can be an enormous startup cost. And if you're only producing a very small amount of milk and you're not really interested in ramping up production, you may find that you would have to be in business for so many years before you even reached a break even point that it's not gonna be worth it for you. Um, you may also find that there's just not a demand for your product, either because the market is already saturated or you're in an area that, um, you know, folks just don't have an appetite for goat or lamb or um, there's, you know, for whatever reason, it's, it's just not something that people in your area are looking to buy. Um, another big reason is, you know, going into business is very, uh, a very risky endeavor. Um, whenever you start a business, you have the potential to do really, really well and you have the potential to fail. And that is unfortunately just a reality is assuming that risk. Um, and that may be something that you're not um, financially prepared for or something that you're not wanting to take on. And then I think the last one, which is really important is that it is totally okay to just have a hobby. Um, I spend, or at least pre-COVID, I spent most of my weekends at dog and horse shows. So um, there is no money to be made in dog or horse shows. And it was a very enjoyable hobby. Um, so if you are enjoying your hobby and the rest of this talk seems overwhelming, there is nothing to apologize for, for just enjoying your hobby. So let's talk a little bit about dairy. Um, Florida is a grade A pasteurized milk only state. That means that in order, in order to legally sell milk for human consumption in the state of Florida, it has to be um, from a grade A dairy and it has to be pasteurized. This program is overseen both by FDACs, which is the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, in cooperation with the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So these two agencies work in concert um, to make sure that all dairy and dairy products produced in the state of Florida um, meet minimum food safety specifications. And they lay out very specific requirements for a number of things. And there is actually, so the FDA has a pasteurized milk ordinance, and I could probably teach a um, six hour class just on this and still not even scratch the surface of all of the requirements. Um, but it is available for free download. It's 450 page document and it is incredibly detailed. Um, but it details specific requirements for everything from construction and maintenance and cleanliness of the milking parlor, so we'll, where the um, does or ewes are milked, um, as well as the milk house where the milk is stored, the type of utensils and equipment, as well as how it is cleaned, sanitized, and stored, and then the um, how the milk is pasteurized, how it's cooled, how it's stored, um, has specific re uh, requirements for having a toilet in the area for the type of flooring that you have, for the type of surfaces. Um, and they are not um, suggestions. They are extremely strict on this. 
So if you are thinking about going grade A before you ever think about breaking ground, it is a very good idea to download and become familiar with the pasteurized milk ordinance and then get involved with FDACs and have your dairy inspector come out ahead of time and they can help check as along the way before you start planning and make sure that you are um, meeting all of the requirements along the way. So you don't want to build and then have them come out and have to start from scratch again. Another option, um, if you were raising a meat breed, um, would be to sell meat, either um, lamb or goat. Uh, the easiest option for this would be to sell these animals directly to a livestock market. Um, and in this situation, lambs and or kids would be your primary product with older animals, coal animals kind of being a secondary product. And these would be sold by the pound at livestock markets. Um, typically, you have pretty limited, if any, interaction with your end customers because you are, um, you're not necessarily going to have to interact, you know, to market your product directly. These animals are being sold, they're being processed elsewhere, and then they're going to be sold elsewhere. Um, but it is really important to understand the market trends and demands and what the market is looking for in terms of size um, and in terms of what type of year um, different size animals are going to be demanded. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. You also have the option of selling directly to the consumer. And in this case, rather than selling live animals, you would be selling the meat. Um, and we do have a really good publication, and this is included in your links, but I put a screenshot of it here so you have that available. That's um, called How Do I Legally Sell Meat from My Own Livestock and Poultry in Florida? Um, and I like this publication because it's kind of conversational and it goes through kind of frequently asked questions about how to sell meat. But what it boils down to is that as a small producer, you kind of have two options if you want to sell meat and not live animals. And so one option involves using a custom processor. So these are processors that are not um, a USDA, um, they don't have a USDA certified inspector on site every day. Um, and they do custom processing for the end consumer. And so you can sell that live animal to the end user prior to processing. They don't have to take possession of it. So you could um, sell your goat and then drop, bring the goat to the, the um, custom processor and the owners of the meat have taken ownership of that animal prior to processing. Um, you can also allow customers to slaughter on site but if you do this option, you are not permitted to help them. Um, and the reason for that is that if you're helping them, then you're actually kind of operating as a processing facility, in which case there's a whole lot more regulations that get involved. Um, so for some religious um, purposes, there, there is some um, specific slaughter specifications that may need to happen. And so you can allow customers to process that animal themselves on your property. You just can't assist with it. The other option would be to sell cuts of meat from your facility. And in order to do this, you would have to become a retail exempt facility. And those animals would have to be processed under federal inspection at a USDA um, certified uh, processing plant. And we do have lists of both of those types of facilities that are in the state of Florida that's pretty current. Both of those options, if you're gonna be selling meat, um, requires quite a bit of interaction with customers um, because you're going to have to um, market that product to them. So you're going to be constantly interacting with them and that can take quite a bit of time and energy to do that. So you have to think about, you know, is that going to be worth, you're cutting out the middleman. Um, so you're going to make more money per pound by selling the meat directly to the consumer versus selling the live animal at the market. Um, but it's going to be a whole lot more work on your part. So you have to kind of decide if that is something that you are interested in, if it's going to be worth your time and energy to do that or not. Um, it is very important to consider, especially with goat and sheep meat, because um, it is important in cultures outside of the um, uh, United States, those uh, meats can be very important for different holidays. And so knowing and being familiar with those calendars um, can be very important. And planning backwards so that your breeding season matches the demands. And so this is a um, example calendar from 2016, but it lists the dates of um, different holidays. So for example, for the start of Ramadan is June 6th in 2016. 
and it talks about um, what type of animal they're looking for. So they are looking for intact or castrated males under 12 months of age. They don't want them overly fat and they want them at about uh, 60 pounds. And so thinking about that ahead of time, you can kind of plan your management cycle ahead of time. Um, there are two calendars that we've linked on here and we're also emailed out to you. Um, but that is extremely important if you're selling meat and also honestly important if you're selling the live animal at the market because you're going to notice that the prices are going to go up at those times as well. Um, the demand for those animals will be higher if you can provide them at a time when the demand in the market is higher. Other options that may allow you to monetize your um, hobby would be being things like a seed stock producer. So if you want to get involved in the breeding end, whether it is uh, meat or dairy or fiber animals, and if you're really into genetics and you want to produce the best of the best, um, this typically would involve you um, getting involved in artificial insemination, at least to some extent, going to shows, developing a reputation. And so your product is selling um, kids um, that could go into um, breeding operations for other producers, potentially selling semen from your rams or your bucks. Um, that can be an option as well. Um, ecological services, this is kind of a new thing that was a little trendy, um, but there are folks who will rent out specifically goats to go in and help clear some areas of invasive weeds. Um, and there's, uh, I provided a link on the resource page with some things to consider for that. Um, but that may be, depending on the area that you live in, something that is in high demand. Um, certainly soaps and lotions is a very popular use of um, goat milk, um, something that I personally enjoy quite a bit. Um, and there's, uh, that's something that's real popular to sell at, at farm stands and farmers markets. Um, wool and fiber for fiber arts. Goat yoga has been kind of a new thing, kind of trendy. Um, and I've also seen where folks have been successful offering um, goat packing. So people would actually kind of rent the goat for the day and they'd go hiking. The goat would wear a little pack and carry their supplies. And they paid really good money to um, have that experience and those Instagrammable photos of walking with a goat up in the mountains. So um, all of those are kind of different options. And I never, um, if you had told me goat yoga would have been a thing 10 years ago, I would have thought you were crazy. I like goats. I like yoga. I don't want my goats anywhere near my yoga. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a market out there. So I think you can get pretty creative with some of this stuff. But all of these options do require quite a bit of research as well as extensive customer interactions and marketing. So um, you can't just, it's not enough to just put it out in the world that you're doing this. You have to really be um, up on top of your marketing options. But I think no matter what you choose, um, there's going to be some good business practices that will be universal. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of these with the rest of our time. Um, and that's going to be developing a really sound business plan, um, record keeping, and then marketing. And that's where Francisco will kind of take over. But I've always uh, appreciated this quote, and I think it's, um, it's true no matter what you do, um, business or personal, is failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, and so I think, you know, if you jump in with both feet and optimism and hope, um, you may have a rude awakening and it's, it's very important to just, you know, research, 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 plan, plan, plan ahead of time. So not sure what that circle, there we go. So let's talk on um, business plans. So there's a couple different segments to a, a good business plan. And one of the um, documents that I've shared with you is something that was been put out by our business school. And it goes through a um, how to write a good business plan and a, a great degree of detail. I think if anyone follows this and um, they could bring it to just about any credit union or bank and probably be fairly assured of getting a good loan. It's very in depth. Um, but you want to start out your business plan by kind of researching the industry. So what, what is the current state of the industry? Um, what's the size? Who are the key players? What is the primary structure? Um, what are the growth trends and potential? And then what are the key factors to success? So what are those things that um, folks who are able to stay in business within the industry have to do in order to be successful? 
And then for your own company, um, what is your concept? What makes it different or similar to other businesses? What products and services are you offering? Um, market analysis, I think this is some, something that we don't always spend enough time thinking about, but um, who is our buyer and not just you know, okay, so folks who are going to buy our um, goat milk or people who like goat milk, but really thinking about, um, you know, where do they live? How far are they willing to travel? Where do they prefer to shop? Um, what's their income level like? What's their education like? Where do they get their information? Um, what kind of advertising do they respond to? Um, all of the demographics and trends that relate to the market. Um, and then overall market size and trends. And I think, you know, it's, it's also important to be careful of trends. Um, if you're on the front wave of a trend, you can come sometimes be really successful. Um, but I've also seen in my years of extension of, of folks all kind of pile on to the newest, greatest idea and it gets saturated and um, goes belly up pretty quickly. So you want to um, kind of be, um, marry your risk taking to um, caution as much as possible. And I think, you know, not get swept up in trends, but think, you know, even once this little trendy thing passes, is this still have staying power? Is this something that, you know, once this current craze goes away, is this something that I can see being a long-term business for five, 10, 15 years, or could I easily transition it if this trend dies down to become something else with the same startup that I'm already putting in? And then looking at the economics of the business, and there are some really good um, resources out there to help you do this. Um, UF has an ag um, economics website that I have shared on the resource page that um, has a ton of calculators and spreadsheets that can help you. Um, I've also shared a, some, um, some uh, blank uh, startup cost generators that can help you kind of think through some of this stuff. Um, but think about where that um, revenue is coming from and what the margin is, um, what your fixed and variable costs are going to be. Startup costs, that can sometimes be huge and how long it's going to take you to, to pay back those startup costs and break even. And then what the profit potential and what the durability, again, of that product is. So um, is this something that's going to um, last the, the test of time or not? And then your marketing plan. So what's your overall strategy? How are you going to market this product and how are you going to advertise it? Okay. I had, I had my, I, had, I was muted all the way. Barbie asks on mm -hmm. the chat box, how do you feel uh, the COVID trend of buying more local meat will affect, uh, will be, what will be the effect a year or two from now? Is it gonna be permanent or is it gonna be something that that is going oh. to change, I guess? Barbie, I wish I knew. Um, I think COVID has definitely shown a light on how complex our food system is. Um, and so as a result, folks have been more interested in um, purchasing food that was grown closer to home. Um, that said, our food system is complex sometimes for good reason. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I wish I had that goes back to, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I think that there, there will always be, and there has been for a while, a trend of, of folks being interested in knowing their farmer. And I think that's what, what can make, um, that's a, a niche area that small farmers can fill um, because it's hard to compete. You know, if you have a handful of goats and you're, you're a small scale producer, it's hard to compete with a really large farm um, for economy of scale. And so I think offering that kind of boutique experience where they feel like they know you and they're buying your product um, is something that will always have value for people. But as far as the number of people who see that value, um, I can't predict what that will be um, because there's also concerns about, you know, with the economy and folks um, being concerned about their income, they may have an interest in buying locally, but will their pocketbook allow them to pursue that interest or are they going to turn to, um, are they going to be forced to buy as inexpensive as possible, in which case they may be forced to support um, less boutique type experiences. So um, I don't know. That's that's one of those risk things that we're kind of, and maybe one of the other agents may have a different opinion on that, but 
that's kind of uncharted and unresearched territory. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of papers written about it in retrospect. <laughs> Ask me again in 10 years and I'll tell you what happened. That's that, you know, that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, it depends probably on, on, on what you do on your local level on, on your marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot to gain because we have exposed the cracks on, on the system, uh, which we have a pretty good system of feeding people in this country, but there's a lot of gaps and opportunities that showed up with, with this, with this uh, pandemic. Uh, so that, I, I think this is fascinating right now. <laughs> I didn't share a solution, but it's just my, my perspective as well. I think that we should focus on the opportunities that we have. For example, in chips, we are importing about more than 50,000 of, of pounds of the products. And in goats, we are importing around 150,000 pounds of, of, of meat. Uh, so that is something that let us know that there is a market for people that grow the meat here in the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, something else that's happened in Florida, and this is not related to COVID, but, you know, changing demographics in Florida and more folks moving in from the islands where um, goat is eaten a lot more. Um, and it's hard, you can't go to Publix and buy, you know, a leg of kid at, at Publix. So we had, there is the potential for small farms to meet some of those needs. Um, where you know people want the taste of home. I've got some colleagues who are from the Caribbean, and they, you know, to them, home is goat curry. So, um, and that's something that's hard to come by um, if you're just going to the shopping mart. So, we have two questions in the chat box. The first one goes to: um, Are we are those import figures from Florida or for the U.S.? The ones that um, Francisco just gave. The, the the state that more meat produce is Texas. I think that we are the number ten right now by the USDA statistics. All right. And then next question: How can we contact with the people that is involved with exporting the goat meat? For example, I'm here in Florida. Who can I contact to probably offer my production? Uh, we are going to talk about that after um, Mac presentation. And then would it be a good idea to try to sell in a bigger city, which is close to your farm? I think yes, um, only because bigger city often means more people. Um, but that, that goes to market research. Um, and looking into, you know, who is in that city and is there a demand in that city? So if you're in a big city that has um, a large population of folks who have immigrated from the islands, that may be something that, um, you know, goat meat could be um, a huge selling point there. Um, if you have a big city of people who are not, you know, traditionally from an area that eats goat meat, then that may not be something that's as much of interest to them. So it just goes to, to doing your market research. But yeah, I think, you know, typically if you're, if you're in Florida, there's not many areas in Florida anymore, unfortunately, that are very far away from a large city. Um, but you can take advantage of that, of being, um, especially if you're willing to take the meat to the customers um, rather than expecting them to come to you. I think there's definitely options. And um, I know in Orlando, um, which is our closest big city to where I live, um, there's some really kind of high-end boutique meat markets where people are paying a premium for um, locally raised meat that they mm -hmm. perceive as being higher value to them. So. All right. So I think um, and another really important thing, and, and whether you're a professional or not, um, so hobby, professional, if you have one goat, record keeping is one of the most important um, animal husbandry practices that I think we teach over and over again. Um, and I kind of say, you know, if, it did, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. <laughs> but um, it, especially when you're getting into business, you need to keep records. Um, and there is, this is this um, Excel spreadsheet up here. I did share the link to this and it's, it's blank and you can fill it into your heart's desire. There are also a lot of really good um, 
software, uh, both free and paid that you can have. There's apps on your phone. Um, you can also do it the old fashioned way and, you know, do it in a notebook if that's what works for you. But um, you have to be able to keep records in order to um, make your business work. And so that includes health records. Um, that's going to be really important, especially if you're selling into the food system. Um, because withdrawal dates are really important. So if you're giving medication to an animal that you're selling milk or meat from, um, it is important to know what medication they've had and when the last day was that they had that medication and what the withdrawal date on the label was for that medication because um, it would be um, a, a big, big no-no for them to have any of that medication in their system or in their milk um, when that gets into the human food chain. Um, breeding records are super important. Um, I think we see this more with um, some of our cattle people where they keep the bull turned out year round and um, may or may not know if a cow has had a calf recently and then that cow may or may not be living there rent free um, for a number of years before they figure out that she's um, kind of scamming the system a little bit. So knowing um, when your does or ewes have been exposed to a male, when you're expecting them to kid or lamb, um, and then know who is not breeding so that you know who to cull. That's incredibly important. Um, Especially with your um, with your young does and, and ewes, being there the first time that they kid or lamb can be very important. Um, or an animal that's had trouble kidding before, um, you know, just keeping track of all of that, knowing, if, you know, if they tend to kid twins or kid triplets, um, if they've had issues, if they've had issues with ketosis before they kid. So having all of that information. Um, land management records, so when did you apply fertilizer, when did you apply herbicide, how much, um, that can become important for some of the conservation practices that um, I'm sure we'll be talking about, as well as some of the um, best management practices and NRCS um, cost share programs that you may get involved in, but keeping track of all of those things. Um, and then as well as income and expenses. Um, I do a really, really on purpose bad job of keeping track of my dog show expenses um, because I don't want to face the music <laughs> of how much I spend to do agility with my dog. Um, but for you guys, if you're going to turn this into a business, you need to know if you're actually making money or not. Um, and if you're not making money, you need to reevaluate if it's a business that you need to be in. And so keeping track of, um, you know, everything that comes in and everything that's costing you. And don't forget to account for your own time as well. I think sometimes when we're keeping track of expenses, we forget to pay ourselves. Um, and that's important that you're considering the cost of your own labor. And again, those can be digital or handwritten. Um, I find Excel easy to work in, others um, not so much, but whatever you're most comfortable in and your extension agent can help you kind of sort through some of those. But I did include um, one, one of the links does have a, the Excel spreadsheet here and it's got multiple pages that you can scroll through that are blank that you can um, plug away and, and use and turn into your own if you'd like to. So with the marketing, I don't want to do any spoilers for Francisco, but I will say to set him up well is that I cannot overemphasize the importance of marketing. Um, the degree to which you're going to have to market and advertise is really going to vary based on your business model um, in terms of what you're selling and if you're selling to a market versus directly to the consumers. Um, but it is really important to know who your customer is, what your customer wants, um, and where they access information so you know how to best reach them, and then to maintain regular communication. And I think as small farmers, um, the experience that you offer, they're not just buying your product, they're kind of buying the entire story of you and the experience and the relationship. Um, and so being able to, um, you know, even just maintaining an Instagram and pictures of your farm regular, they're buying into all of that. And that is all part of the value added to your product. Um, and if you don't have the time or energy to do that, that may not be the right um, business model for you. So you may consider doing, you know, direct to market sales rather than selling to the consumer. Um, so it is important to kind of appreciate the amount of time and effort that uh, marketing can take. So it is not some, it's not going to be a last, um, you know, a, a last minute detail of your business. It's going to be one of the more time consuming aspects of your business. So if after hearing all of this, you're still kind of thinking about going pro and not just going to stick with um, it as a hobby, 
I think, you know, before you ever break ground and, and I'm using break ground kind of loosely, but you know, before you ever get started on a business, if you don't already know your extension agent, make it a point to give them a call. Um, we are on your side. We want you to be successful. Um, even if being successful means steering you away from making mistakes. Um, I think some of my biggest success stories has been when I've talked people out of going into business because it was not a good business plan for them, but we want our clients to be successful and we're going to provide you with good information and hold your hand through it and help you um, think through things. So call your extension agent and we will help you. That's our job and that's what we love doing. If you're in Lake County, give me a call. Um, but all of, I think every extension agent is we're in the job because we like to help. Um, your local small business administration office and your county economic development offices. Those are um, agencies that a lot of folks aren't aware even exist, but they can be um, hugely helpful when it comes to market research. Um, so they can really help you understand the demographics of folks in your area and um, looking into some of those market research things that you need for your business plan. Um, reach out to the agency that licenses and enforces. So if you're going to do dairy, reach out to FDACs, reach out to FDA, get involved with them um, before you ever get started on building your grade A dairy. And then reach out to your professional association. So getting involved with, um, you know, American Dairy Goat Association or American Boar Goat Association, all of those so that you um, are able to to network with other producers in your area, learn from their mistakes. Um, I found, you know, within the farming community that um, people really, it's not competitive. People are wanting to help one another and um, you can really benefit from the experience of your peers. And, you know, oftentimes I've seen, you know, newbies go and say, hey, I'll come um, offer some, some physical labor in return for a little bit of knowledge and go learn from somebody else. And that can be a great way to do some hands-on learning. Um, research, research, research. I think I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you really need to know the ins and outs and everything about your business before you get started. And then take the time to really develop a robust business plan and invite the very smartest people that you know to poke holes in it. Um, so don't just do a business plan and then cross your fingers and hope it works. Do your business plan, put the best one together, and then ask people to tear it apart. Um, so you want to have, you want to find out everything that could possibly go wrong on the front end and keep fixing it before you start investing money. Um, and that's really going to help you on the um, other end of it. I know it's exciting when you want to get started and you want to, you know, sometimes jump the gun and jump in with both feet, but um, taking the time to really do it right and think things through is going to pay dividends in the end and save you so much heartache and um, time and money. So that is all I have for you guys before I turn you over to Francisco to drill in more about the importance of marketing, unless there are any questions that we missed, Kaylin. Um, there, thank you everyone who has been sharing the resources, um, especially when it comes to the harvesting facilities. Um, Someone, two people had asked if they can receive this presentation. Um, sure. I will send it to Janelle and he can send it out to the group. And it's my understanding that the recording will be on our YouTube page. Yes. Okay. So this uh, recording will, you can access on the C flag YouTube channel. And Cafe Latino. You're going to share on Cafe Latino as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that right was now it's streaming, so questions. it's going to be there uh, instantly. Uh, also, so watch it later. Our presentation we upload in the uh, Central Flor Central Florida Livestock um, Agent Group that is online. So we are going to share with all of you the link later. Okay. And I was I was adding some of the links uh, to. Uh, extension publications that we have for Florida. The last one, I couldn't find the direct one that, that, that took you exactly where I wanted you to go anyway, but I found uh, the, uh, a list, uh, the, the last one that I sent is a list of custom exempt um, processing facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have that. I know that I sent out a, a, an email earlier with the information uh, that the, or resources that, that Meg, uh, you had uh, handed me out for, for you guys. 
I wish we had a binder to give you, but that's not the case. But yeah, this, normally, this will do for now. A binder. But yes, do check your email. If you didn't get it, email Janelle and he'll send it out again. But um, we did put together, there are a lot of resources available out there. Um, and I think one of the best ones is the UF Small Farms website, which is where I pulled a lot of stuff from. Um, but lots of good resources on starting businesses and market stuff. And a lot of the, a lot of the legwork has already been done for you. Um, so you just have to plug in your own numbers and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's helpful. Yeah. And again, it's on your email uh, inbox already. If you register through email, yep. uh, I'll, hopefully you got it because I did. And that's okay. Anyway. So next topic is going to be uh, uh, done by, uh, conducted by Francisco Rivera. He's our extension uh, agent in Hillsborough County. Um, he's uh, area of expertise in small farms. Um, and with small farms, it comes livestock as well. So anyway, just take it away and we'll be scanning for questions uh, as we have, uh, you know, with Meg's talk. Thanks for behaving, by the way. Um, thank you, Jonah. Um, if somebody don't understand something that I said um, today, that's good because if you understand, that means that you are learning Puerto Rican English. So, welcome to our translator that. anyway, right? All right, so that's great because the translator do not understand my my accent. <laughs> All right, well, welcome to everybody. I am Francisco Rivera. Um, so today I have two different um, topics. We are going to talk briefly about what is marketing, different marketing channels, and then we are going to start talking about what is social media and what are different alternatives that we have for um, promote and make that connection with our customers. Um, so the, the objective for today is that you can learn something about marketing. But before that, I want to let you know where you can find us. You can find us on, f the, on Facebook and YouTube channel in UF IFA CFLAC or Cafe Latino. Um, so if you want to see videos or, uh, about different economic uh, topics regarding agriculture, you can go to UF IFA CFLAC or if you have an issue with a weed, we have there a list of the invasive species from North Florida, Central and South. So I invite you to just follow us in all our social media channels that we are using. So the objective, how, how I say before, is just that you can learn something about marketing, explore different channels and an alternative that you have for at the end what you want to do it right um that people knows who you are what is your product and what is your service um so first of all let's start um defining what is marketing and what we are trying to do with marketing is that we are trying to educate our customers about what about our product or service that we that we have so we have to show in them the value of our products and is that need their needs or their wants then we have to to have what we call the three piece right three piece of, of marketing that is a, a, a fair price that the people are willing to pay a place that sometimes we don't define place, but the place is the area that we are going to sell that product. And in order for, for do that, we need to promote that product and then the people are going to pay for that. So that is basically what is marketing. Uh, what are the different strategies that I'm going to use like a farmers in order to sell my product, promote, promote my, my product, add value to my product and, and sell it. So that is basically what, what is doing marketing. We are trying to, we are trying that our customer 
when they think about gold, they said, okay, Catherine half gold, um, crystal half gold. So when people think about, about the product, they have you as a customer, as a, they have you as a farmer, and they say, this is the person that I'm going to buy their product. So that, that is why it's so important, all the strategies that we are going to talk today, because it's, it's the way that people are going to recognize your goals, that, in, that how we call it, you know, your brand or your product, what you are going to sell. So this is basically something that Meg talked before. So globally, these are the demographic. Um, most of the people are American in the United States and that is like common sense, right? But there is other groups that you need to think about because are the group that eat more the product that you are um, growing, that is the, the is the, is the, the goats and chips in this case. So basically we have around 80% of Hispanics, Asian 6%, these are the, the, the new stats from the previous year, Mid-Eastern 4%, South Asian and Indian is 0.6%. And in Florida we have a more, most of the population of this segment, that is how we call, are Hispanic, uh, Asian is 3%, and 21% of the people that are here um, came from other areas from, from, from the work, from, from, from other, other areas of the world, I'm sorry. So basically, the, the goat and, and chips, they, the people eat around the world and here in you in United States like is is growing the demand how how I told before we are importing see uh, 55,000 of pound in in chips and in, in chip meat and in gold meat is around 160,000 so if you compare that with previous year the industry is growing around 1% per year. So what that means is that people are consuming the food and there is a, a market available and we have a, a space for, for growth, goat and cheap because it's an industry that, that is, 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 is growing. So that is what, what we need to, to understand. So you can see the order of the people, how they consume the, the gold meat. Meg talk about this calendar. So what this means is that, for example, the Hispanic people, they are going to consume the meat in holidays and a special event, like for example, when People make when when a girl bear her 15 year, they call quinceañeros. So that is one of you know all that kind of parties or fiesta that Hispanic people make. That is an opportunity for sell the the goat and cheap meat. Um, um, Christmas, New Year, and the the people from from the west from from the eastern area. Um, they have a specific day and that's why um, you have to take a look on this calendar. It's very important because you need to plan ahead in order to have the product av available when the people need or want, you know, because this is not like a need, but if people want the product, if, if, if it's not available, they are going to look for it somewhere. So these are the different alternatives that you have. Direct marketing is like sell the product directly to the person who want to buy it. Um, you can sell your product in the farm uh, or you can sell the product um, live in the farm and then the people can process um, or you can do the other way. 
you can sell the product, process it, and then sell to the to the to the customer. So they are different um, alternative. Also, um, you can sell your product to the dif different type of restaurant, meat brokers, and they are other traditional market that you can you can um, sell your product. Sell the product to meat broker is not recommended most of the time because the price that they are going to pay probably is going to be lower than the price that you can sell your 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 animals. So that is something that you have to to consider. Um, it's not recommended um, buy animal from auctions. And the reason is that sometimes you don't know where that animal came from. So just be careful because sometimes people are selling animals and they don't vaccinate. So ask the proper question just to be sure that what you are buying is a high quality um, animal. So I'm going to mention some of the different traditional market like the auction, so you can go to that link and, uh, and see different options that you can find. You can go to the Florida farmer market and you can see all, all that points, uh, purples, blue, that are all the farmer market that we have around the state. Right here, I live in Plant City and I have a farmer market that is like three or four minutes from my house. And that a specific farmer market, there are a lot of Hispanic there. So I know that if I want to sell my product, that is a good place to show my product. And there is the people that are willing to, to buy that product. So I just include the, the website below on the bottom um, that we can share with all of you, or you can do a a Google search and then type fresh from Florida, farmer market, and you can find it. This is something important that I, I, I believe that is going to provide you a lot of value. Um, if you participate in this different type of event, this one is just an example of the Florida Dairy Goat Association, but they have a uh, Florida Meat Goat Association, and they have other um, goats and sheep association that is important that you go there and participate because you can see what are the other animals. You can um, show your animals and you can get more credibility in the market. So all this kind of stuff, for example, if you sell a grand champion, the people are willing to pay a lot more than the price of the meat only because he's a specific breed and because he's a champion. Also, you can, for example, if, if you have a, 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 a male goat, <laughs> um, you can sell the semen and people are willing to pay that semen and add value. So all these kind of, of events are going to provide you an add value to your product and that's what you want. You are looking in marketing different ways that people can recognize what is the value that you have in the market and why I should pay the, the price of that meat or animal uh, because at the end, what you are looking is for make profit. Nobody want to have a, have a, 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 an enterprise that don't make money. Um, okay, so right now we are going, th there is any question right now about this first part? They're just trying to decipher what the heck you're talking about. Okay, I I'm understand. I'm, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no, we have one from Mary. As a wool broker, this is so important. Your wool is much more valuable if it has shown and it's been judged. Thank you for that, Mary. Also, Mary, I went to the, I present in, in the American Day Association three years ago, and people pay 15,000 for a goat, for a dairy goat. 
if I make that, I'll be happy just to sell one every every three years for fifteen thousand dollar. So you see, there there is a lot of, of of good opportunities there. Okay, so now we are going to talk about why social marketing is important and what different strategies we can um, we can do it in order to have a position on. on on this, all these social media, because right now it's very competitive. But I'm going to share with all of you guys what things um, help us and, and and help us to people follow us. So, first of all, website, um, social media are websites and application that help you to connect and socialize with other participants in order that you can. Um, build or connect with others. That is basically what is the social media. So, so what we what we need to know about social media. All of you uh, can identify all the um, different brands right now in the market. There is anyone that you don't know what is. Do you know who's the penguin? All right, so don't worry because probably you don't um, recognize that brand. It's possible that it's not important, but there are some brands that are really important that you can follow because it's the way that people now connect with others. Uh, before people send letters, hand, hand write letters, and right now that doesn't happen. People just send email or just send um, text message or other social media that we are going to discuss. So basically, this is what is happening. 3.8 million of people. Hey, are you going to discuss the penguin or not? Because everybody's asking what the heck is it? <laughs> it's okay. We are going to discuss that. Don't worry because that is a a social media from China. So don't worry because probably most of us don't talk um, any, you know, that that type of language. So no worries. But we are going to talk about later. Um, so we have 3.8 billion of people that are actively in the social media and that is 50% of the total population of the world. So that means that this is going to stay, everybody's using it, and this is not going to change. And the growth of this industry, if you compare right now with the gold industry, we said that the gold industry 1%, this industry is 9.2%. So basically right now you can do everything from your cell phone. Also 3.75% of the people access to social media using their cell phone. And that is in, in the whole population, 90%, 99 people of 100 are using their phone just to get in the social media. So that's what is very important to be immersed on, on, this, on this time in the 21st century. So let's talk about the penguin, right? Basically the first four are from United States and are the, the social media that most of the people use. So at least you need to make something, this is what this means, something for Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, or Facebook Messenger. Um, that I will say Facebook, YouTube, and now LinkedIn because something that I didn't include here because it's too much information for you and I don't want that, you know, like, like, like you feel tired, is that if you are looking for people that, for people that are willing to pay a better price, I will go to LinkedIn because most of the professional um, people that are doing different type of business, they are um, actively in, in the LinkedIn webpage. So that is all another, um, media that I will focus um, as soon as you can, you know, make your profile, profile of your, uh, of your company enterprise and start building um, your, your brand. 
that now that is a trending right now. People call personal branding or enterprise brand. Uh, we have a comment from uh, uh, the chat box. The issue with some social media platform is that they don't allow selling of product animals. So uh, to have, uh, you have to set up a, set, a separate web page and use links. Um, the way to uh, circumvent that is to use social media for marketing, right? Um, if, if that's the case, that if, you know, you cannot sell anything through there, like an well, app. Um, every social media is different. Um, but remember, when we are thinking about marketing, we are, you know, we are talking about different areas. One is uh, sell your product is part of the marketing, but it's not marketing at all. It's, it's one component. And we are thinking here in promotion. That is one of the piece of marketing. People say the piece, place where you are going to sell, maybe we can sell on on the social media, but you, you can promote your product. And something that sometimes uh, that people just uh, don't understand is that likes don't sell your product. So don't get on the trap of likes because people that are following you, uh, that doesn't mean that they really are going to sell your product, but promoting your product is going to make that when people see your brand, they can recognize who you are, where you came from. And that's why it's important that you can share your story on, on, on this social media. Of course, for example, I have some, some friends that they are ready have a contract with brokers and other other people that buy your products so they don't use social media, why? Because they have the product sell. But we, that we are starting in a business and probably your market for a start is going to be the, the retailing, probably you need to push harder just to find your market at the beginning. When you start selling your product, you know, your your business is going to tell you. If you are producing and you are selling all your product, what does that mean? That's mean that I need to produce more. So that way you can invest in your in your business. But if you are not selling the meat, don't try to produce more because you have a, a, a problem about you have a problem with the market and, and sell your product. So that's why we always recommend um Start small, that way you can um, learn from your mistake and error. All right, so uh, Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Uh, do you feel identified with this quote? Probably not, or probably yes. But for example, we, uh, in our case, we provide field visits. We help you guys to identify weeds. Um, some years ago, we just visit the field. Right now, with all the technologies, people send me pictures to my cell phone, by email, and I, 10 years ago, I wasn't thinking about that the present will be how it is. And all these technologies are evolved or are changing too fast. For example, um, in six months, probably we have a better cell phone, maybe 12K, maybe 18K. I don't know too much about technology, but you know, every, every time it's like advancing. Right now we are working with robotics uh, and other type of things that the agriculture from 100 years ago is not the same agriculture that we are looking at our farms and the technology that we are using are, are evolving. That was the word that I was looking for. <laughs> Sounds pretty at least. <laughs> All right. Oh, something happened here. What you did, Jonah? Okay, so this is a question that you need 
to answer yourself, what is your goal? Fine. Um, for example, Meg said that being a hobby is or half a hobby is okay. And I agree with that. Um, in my case, I think that a hobby is, is a part of something in order to be on the level that I want to be in, in, in my organization, probably in five, 10 years. So if I am thinking um, entrepreneurship and have a business, so I need to understand, of course, right? The business, but what are the steps that I need to take in order to sell that product and have profit and if it's possible, if that is your goal, um, grow your, your farm. Um, all, all, other thing that you need to think here, and it's really important, is think about yourself, who you are, what are your values, what, when I say values, what are the things that you believe and why you are doing in your farm because for some people or some what we what we call follower people follow others not for what they are doing they follow other what because why they are doing so that is something that you need to think about because all the values show be what you are going to show to shows or use in your social media. For example, I provide you all this list of ideas. I'm not going to discuss all that, but if you think in your operation, that is how we are going to call now. We don't have goat anymore. We have our operation. In our operation, we follow a specific um, process, right? So by the animal is part of the process vaccine the animal or, or vaccinate or put vaccine to the animal is, a, is another part of the process. Why you are doing that? In order to have a health herd, I'm going to use this word, you know, but um, what food are you providing to that animal? So we know, um, of, I'm an animal nutritionist, so I'm going to try to just go briefly on this. So what kind of, of nutrition are you providing to the animal? We know that when the animal are smaller, they need more protein after a couple of months, then you are going to reduce the quantity of protein. And then when the animal is, is producing, depending on the quantity of meal, we can change the nutrition and the quantity of, of feed that we provide to that goat. Um, so we say at the beginning, that we are educating our customer. And Jonah is going to talk about this later, about animal welfare. But what I want to bring here to the table is that all these practices that we are showing him or all this process are part of your farm history, where you are located, how many animals you have, how you, treat, how you treat the kids, all that is information that is yours. Uh, others can um, make the story the same way that you are going to, to make it. So that at the end is one of the, of the alternative that are going to add value to your product and your service. Francisco, we have a... Um production question. So someone asked, notice the e electronic tags in the goat's ears. Are many producers using electronic tags for production recording, um, using it as a marketing tool for paddock to plate? What, what is the question? So they saw that the electronic ear tags were in the goat's ears. Um, and they're asking, are many producers using those tags for production recording? and then using it as marketing for paddock to plate. Okay, so the, the question is about the electronic tax. Yes. If there are many producers that are using that? Yes, and why? 
Well, I, I know that uh, we have, let me let me open again the, the presentation because something happened here. All right. So there is a program from FDAG, it's the Florida Department of Agriculture that they, they tax your animals, but it's a specific for for identify a, a parasite. Disability. So that, that's that's what but I can address that question real quick uh, from a marketing perspective. Um, our consumer wants as much information as possible for uh, from what what happened to that food, what happened to that animal, how it was treated. So uh, that's a story that we have to sell. And uh, in order to sell that story, having investing in EID uh, technology to guarantee the wholesomeness of a product, yeah, that would be a good idea. We're moving towards uh, requiring all livestock to be EID or uh, you know, tagged with uh, electronic IDs. Um, that's that's been pushed for several years and uh, in the future i'm probably sure that that this is going to be a nationwide push well i i i will say i i know that that is coming but you need to to see if that is cost effective before use that type of technology that is why my you know that is my comment on that point that is good is good because you can track your animal for example, if you are in Puerto Rico, uh, that will be very helpful because sometimes some people get things that are not not their property. So that is a good way that you can track your animal and get the people that are taking your stuff. So this is a question that you have to think about is what are the resources that you, that you have that can give you a, a competitive value and you you know you don't have to think about this what i try is that i i digest some of the different areas for you so you can think about the different lotion that make talk um if you are going to sell meat um milk if you are going to process that milk if you are going to sell the skin of the animal if you are going to make compost there are different products that you can get from the goat industry. Also, there is some people that they rent their goats just to clean green areas, uh, just to uh, biological control mowing is how, how I call. So they can, they can eat um, that area. Also, you can use goats for, for, for eat some branches too. It's a, it's, a, it's a practice that we are going to talk about tomorrow. It's a conservation practice. So that there are different um, examples of things that you can do. It you can do yogurt, ice cream, cheese, uh, different products of soap. Yeah, we have a comment here on the chat box as well. Uh, Mabani uh, Lizardi talks about uh, USDA Veterinary Services. Uh, that uh, they have that program, animal disease traceability, and they will go to your farm and apply tax for your animals. Does this, uh, I'm talking, I'm asking her or him, I, I don't know what you are, sorry. I just have your email <laughs> and your name. Um, is this a, uh, is the USDA vet service, uh, uh, you know, charging for this? And you can put it in a chat box or you can open your mic if you want. All right, so you can put it in, your chat, in the chat box. Go ahead, keep going, Francisco. All this process that you are going to follow in your farm, um, anyway, it's important that you record in a place that you can write it. Uh, but at the end, it's going to be beneficial to you because it's going to start telling what is your farm history. And that's what people follow in the social media. That is something that you are going to said every time so if you repeat something and keep repeating and repeat and repeat 
them is going to be like automatically in your mind, but not only in your mind, it's going to be in the mind of your customer, your clientele. And that's what you are trying to do with marketing. Just being, we use a, a word, John and I, we need to be intentional in what we want to do it and be focused in, in our goal, our main goal. We want to sell the product. We need to show the people the product, go everywhere. Um, if you can go to a fair, if you can trade your product because you are not selling it, that is a way of make businesses. So, you know, there are a, a whole of different alternatives that you can exchange one service for your product, uh, maybe for marketing to other organizations. So there are a, a, a lot of, 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 of great things that you can do when you have a, a product that is valuable for somebody. And that's why I think that this is so excited to me. <laughs> so this is our other alternative for, for promote your product. For example, you can make caps of the name of your product, your company, or your service, uh, um, teachers, uh, we in, in CIFLA, when we are doing the artificial insemination um, course for, for, for beef cutter, we provide them um, sometimes cups, sometimes mugs, sometimes um, teacher. And in that way, there are different, uh, we can make pens, um, anything like, for example, some people use the, the we, we call the flash drive or the USB drive. It's like the extended memory that we put in the computer. And for, ex, for example, when, when, when somebody bring me that, that is something that I always use it. So I see the name of the company. So that in, in, you know, bring something, something that people can use and that way they can stay in your mind. They, they can stay your company in, in, in your mind in their mind, sorry. So I make all this list of different uh, free areas that you can market your product. Um, if somebody have interest in, in organics, that is something that everybody asks me, you can go to Green People. Also, you can market in, in Craigslist. Craigslist is like, I don't know, I, I feel that really is like weird the way that is the, the web page, but a lot of people uh, go there. Also, there are some apps that you can sell your products. And I, I, uh, and I think that the name of one of all the different apps is Offer Up. A lot of people, Hispanic people that I know, they say, oh, I buy everything for Offer Up. I, I don't use that, but you know, they are different areas that you can explore and that way you can like spread um, your product everywhere and, and be recognized like like a brand or like a company. So this is just an example. Just remember to make just your story and, and, and one of the ideas that you can take it from today is that if you write the process that you are doing in your farm, if you are taking pictures, all that kind of stuff, videos, all that kind of stuff are going to help, help you to build your brand, your personal brand, your organization brand. This is uh, the stock jar market. I, I like this because when you start looking at it, you can see what is the price that people are paying for the uh, goats and chips. So it's a good um, choice for half a range about how much people are paying from the lowest price to the higher price. So that can um, help you to provide a, a price that the, that the people is willing to, to pay. This is uh, the, the Craigslist webpage. And that is basically um, what is my, my presentation. I hope that you had, had fun and that you 
learn something today. Jonah, are you there? I'm here. I'm just working on <laughs> on three different. Oh, we have Joe Walter here. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's here. He's overseeing you. Um, okay, we have. Uh, I didn't see job. any more questions. Okay. Yeah, in Australia. Some great information about Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. I know that other countries are ahead of the curve in terms of uh, using technology such as EIDs and stuff like that. Anyway, so I want to uh, thank my speakers. I know that Meg had some uh, uh, circumstances that, that were pretty dire, and but she still made it. Or, uh, anyway, just uh, uh, hopefully she'll, she'll join us uh, for later talks. Um, we're, we're ahead of schedule. Thank, uh, thank you for your patience anyway with the ramblings and stuff. But uh, I want to I wanna, uh, remind you um, to, go, to go in this link um, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm sharing, I'm highlighting it here. Or if you are on, on your computer, you can take your, a picture of your cell phone and then you can, uh, you can go directly to our, our survey our Qualtrics survey, it's gonna be the same survey for today than it's gonna be for tomorrow. And uh, we just wanna catch some information from, from uh, you know, what we talked about today and hopefully it was uh, educational for, uh, for you. Um, so we can, uh, again, evaluate our effectiveness and, uh, and then move, move on um, with, uh, other other information that we can get uh, based on on your answers. I'm trying to get my. Uh, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this thing because I cannot write here um, at the same time. I'm putting it in the chat box. Our survey uh, link. That's for us. That's the most important part of this whole thing. Um, uh, so if you could take time, you can click that link here. Uh, we're going to continue to share that link um, as uh, the week moves on uh, and, and, and we have more more of these presentations for you. Anyway, just uh, uh, I uh, hope that this session was educational, informative and, and worthwhile. Uh, we're going to have more. Can they still sign up for tomorrow? Um, I think so. And if not, um, you can just use that the same link and it'll take you, it'll bring you to tomorrow. We have a full house tomorrow on the registry, um, but if for some reason we're, we're up to more than 100 people, um, we have uh, Facebook Live that we're scanning uh, uh, as well. If, you, if, if there's any questions that arise, we can catch them and, and, and ask them uh, through here. Um, anything else that I, that I need to talk about today? Do I cover? Did I cover it all? Again, thank you. Uh, I sent you guys everything that you requested through email, personal emails, and uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, pretty good for now. So continue to behave, and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. See you later. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, everybody. Caitlin and and uh, Caitlin and, and, and Francisco and if Joe wants to stay too and Tim I don't know if Tim's still here he's probably Do you want me to save the chat or does it matter? Um, it will save automatically. Okay. Uh, Jonah. Yeah. Jonah, you, you got a problem with your survey. What when happened? you get down to the, when you get down to the point, it says mark all the 
following that uh, pertain to you or something, it, it will work. only mark one, one, it'll only take one mark. Perfect, I'll, I'll fix it. Okay. See? That's as far as I got so far. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. Yeah, that's why you fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let me stop the live feed somehow. Stop recording.